good to see you all here. Please stand and join us as we worship today. Two, three, and... Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I sing it out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. This morning, one, two.
believe it was a Thursday night, Sam called us because he was in centrifuge. And he wanted to let us know, his mom and I know, that he had, had given his, his life to the Lord. He had given his life to the Lord. Amen. And I got to baptize Sam when he was six, right? When he was very young. Sam, Sam came down and he knew all the right answers and he had all the head knowledge. And I did the same thing. My dad's here. And I went through the same thing. When I was eight, I had a friend and his sister that came down and, and I knew all the answers and I got baptized. And it took me a few years to get that extra 18 inches from here to here. And Sam did that. And I just want you to know how proud your mom and I are of you. I know that I haven't, there's a reason I haven't said, I haven't said much about it because it's very, very dear to me, very personal. And I'm very proud of you, and I love you, and I want you to know a couple of things. As a man out there in the world, you've got a special target on your back. But as a man who's committed his life to God, you've got an even bigger target on your back. It's our job to help to equip you. It's your job to put on the armor. Amen. It's our job to help instruct you. It's your job to pick up the sword. It's your job to go and fight the battle. God's got the second point of the view. And I can't be, I couldn't possibly be any power of you than I am right now. You coming out here in front of all these people to make an outward expression of what's already gone on inwardly in your life. But just because this is an outward expression doesn't mean that it's trivial or it has no value. This may be a ritual, but it's an important ritual. Just like when we have communion or, or the Lord's Supper or any of those things that we do. They're outward expressions of what we've already done inside. And you are setting an example for your baby sister because she's already asking questions about when she can be baptized. So even if it doesn't matter for anything else, that matters for one. And that's enough. Okay. Amen. 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 All right, let's give you some more All right. Sam, what brings you to be back to the waters today? As we go to God in prayer, let's remember some names. We have Miss Sheila Huff, Miss Paulette Hart, Mary Rose Balch. She wanted to ask that we remember her to keep praying that her uh, sense of taste returns. Remember Jerry and Trish Price. They're, they're here with us today. Amen. 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 Uh, Brother Jerry asked if we just continue to pray for him and, and for Miss Trish as they uh, still try to fight through some of these issues. Pray for Christy Johnson's mother. Pray for Walter and Pat Rudd. Remember Miss Linda Poteet's Aunt Mary. She took a fall this week at Cracker Barrel and busted her face up pretty good, so pray for her. Pray for little Jude Riley, who's at Vanderbilt, was able to come off the ECMO machine, the, the heart machine, but is still on life support. He's only two months old. So remember, Mr., uh, remember the Riley family, remember little Jude. And then continue to pray for the Adams family this, this week and the death of their son, Connor. He's the little boy that we prayed for last week, and he did, in fact, pass away. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you know our hearts, and you know our minds, you know everything that we struggle with, you know everything that we're dealing with on a daily basis. God, we pray that you will just bless us, you'll fill us, and Lord, if there's sin in our lives, we pray that you'll convict us. Lord, we thank you for the praises. Um, like Sam being baptized because he came to know you as Lord and Savior. 
God, I know that there are people in this congregation today that are asking the questions, that are, that are searching for the right answers. But Lord, you are the truth, and you're the way, you're the life, and everything that we say and do brings you glory or points people away from Jesus. Let us do the former. Let us always be pointing people to you. We love you. We praise you. We ask this in your name. Amen. A few announcements. Today is our fifth Sunday picnic right after the church service this morning. Um, we, we ask that if you didn't bring anything, just come and enjoy fellowship, enjoy the food. We're going to have plenty. The burgers smelled fantastic. Kind of wanted to stay out there. Uh, but Brother Jay said I'd be fired if I didn't. <laughs> Anyways, we're going to be honoring couples who have uh, been married for 50 plus years. So y'all come and enjoy all that. There are no evening activities tonight. Next Sunday, August 6th, is our back to school bash for all the students in both children and youth ministries. We're going to have a huge slip and slide down the hill out here. And so, yeah, woohoo. So we're going to ask all of the kids and youth to partake in that. And also all of the adults that are willing, you guys uh, pop your Advil, ibuprofen, whatever, and just let's get ready. It's going to be fun. Let's, let's slide down the hill. But we also want to invite the whole church. You guys come out and, and just fellowship with us. We're going to have hamburgers and hot dogs again. I know two weeks in a row. How Baptist is that? Uh, we're going to eat together. We're just going to have a good time. So bring a, bring a lawn chair, bring a lawn game, bring a pop-up tent, whatever you want to bring. Bring some homemade ice cream. Bring some Bluebell if you don't make homemade ice cream. Bluebell will work just fine. I like that too. It'll be a come and go Stay the full time if you'd like, 5 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. And it's going to be a great opportunity for us to gather around the young people as they get ready to start another school year. So y'all come next week, um, 5 to 7.30. And then on Sunday, August 13th, we're going to have a special called business meeting at the end of the p.m. service. And that's going to be for recommending a children's director and also for the nominating committee to, uh, to have all their stuff done. All right. Brother Davis. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, as we come to you in prayer again, Father, we just thank you for your son Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. Father, we now ask you to be with Jonathan and Brother Jay as they bring our, our music and our message to us this morning. Just behind Satan out of this building here, huh, Father, we just ask that. Father, for these requests that you heard earlier, we just turn them over to you, dear Father, and your will be done in each and every one of these situations. Father, for each and every person that's represented here today, give us strength, guidance, wisdom, and knowledge as we go forward next week, dear Father. And for these, these tithes and offerings that we're about to take, use them to further thy kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I know only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm going to see a victory I'm going to see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord Please stand and join us we continue There's power in mighty name of Jesus let me walk you wait to see will win I'm not backing down from any giant I know how this story ends yes I know how this story ends all right claim it church I'm gonna see a victory a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory 
victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Turn it for good. All right, sing it out. Same thing. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. And I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and hear my broken spirit, and somehow Jesus Jesus came and brought to me the sing it out church here we go oh victory in Jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me and I knew him and I'm
plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for that victory. We thank you for the promise that you have given us. Yes, Jesus. Through your death on the cross, but more importantly, through your resurrection, you've conquered death, Lord. We love you and thank you so much for making us co-heirs with you. Please stay with us, Lord, here in these final days to be a light shining for you. Help us to live constantly glorifying you in all that we do and all that we say, Lord. Let us point the way home to you. We love you so much in your holy and precious name for your glory. We all say, Amen. 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 I hope you'll open up your Bibles this morning to the book of Philippians chapter 3. And I'm going to read the first nine verses and I hope that you'll follow along with me. Some of you have mentioned this morning that I look different than I normally do. Thank you. <laughs> Patty told me last night that I wasn't going to wear a full suit today that she said this picnic day you need to go as a picnic person so I wore some dark jeans and I did wear a coat and I wore a little shirt so this is my picnic attire so uh, if you don't understand that if you're mad at me talk to Patty all right beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3 I've got to hurry because people are smelling those burgers and they're some people have told me that they'll leave early if I don't get finished. So anyway, let's get finished. Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to begin in verse number 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss. For the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And I'm going to close right there. Paul starts out this section in chapter 3 by using that word, finally. You get the impression when he says, finally, that evidently it's going to close. It's going to be over. He's going to finish his letter. But then, in the fourth chapter, verse 8, he uses the word, finally, again. So, Paul says, finally, brethren, and yet we're only really about halfway through the letter. So, anytime you hear a preacher say, finally, just ignore it. It doesn't mean anything. Just a pause in the action, he's going something else. Well, 
in rapid fire order here, he just gives us some things that ought to be very important to us, and I hope they are. I'm going to go through these things as quickly as I can this morning. I know many of you, your stomachs are growling right now because you're smelling the burgers and the dogs outside. And I know that I see people are wiping their lips because their mouth is watering and wanting to taste that good food. So we'll be out of here by 11.30 or 12. <laughs> but Paul repeats the theme of his letter and he shows us the source of our joy in the statement when he says, Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Jesus, folks, is the ultimate source of of our joy. And the difference between happiness and joy is this. Happiness depends on what happens to us. Joy depends upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter what you're going through in your life. If you know Jesus, you can still have joy in your heart. You can be going through the worst time in your life and still have joy in your life if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. So, we know that Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, will always provide for you the joy that you need in your life. Then in verse 2, he takes up a serious note. He gives us three statements of warning. He says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, and beware of the mutilation. Now, those are three rather sharp statements that Paul uses here that really are kind of referring to the very same thing. When he uses the word dogs there, he's using a figure of speech for those who peddle false doctrine. For those who are preaching a lie. Those who are teaching anything contrary to the truth of God. Now the word mutilation, he's talking about those who were saying that in order to be saved, you had to submit to the right of circumcision. And these false teachers were trying to make outward requirements for the inward experience of salvation and they said you need to be circumcised. So Paul is really talking here about false teachers and Paul understands what a lot of people don't understand today and that is that this whole matter of salvation folks is of eternal importance. Amen. It's of eternal importance. It has to do with whether you're going to be in, in eternity forever and ever but I say to you, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, woe be it to those who ever try to mislead someone about how to get the person to hell, to heaven, and actually is going to lead them to hell. Folks, listen, you need to be careful about how you talk to people about salvation. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 8, Paul says, If we or an angel of heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Let it be a curse. It's a serious thing to tamper with the plan of salvation. Salvation is the most important subject in the entire world. I don't care what you think is important. Salvation triumphs over it. It's much more important. So you better be interested in eternity this morning because you're going to be there forever and ever and ever. Folks, life is very short. Life is very short. Time is fleeting. And yet out there in eternity, we're going to be somewhere forever and ever 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 and always. So verse 3, Paul lays down three characteristics of true salvation. He says, we are the circumcision. And what he's saying there is what is true, what true salvation is. And then he says, first of all, who worship God in the spirit. It's a spiritual matter. It's something that takes place between the human soul and God. That's what salvation where it happens. It happens inside the soul. Secondly, he says rejoice in Christ Jesus. That word we can really say there we need to boast in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to boast about him. What he's saying is we don't boast in ourselves nor do we boast in our human merit, but we boast in what Jesus has done for us. And he did it all on Calvary's cross, folks. He suffered and died there. He was buried. Three days later, he came out victoriously alive. And then eventually he ascended back into heaven. But folks, one day he's coming back and we better be ready when he gets back. I hope that you're ready for his return. Then thirdly, he says, have no confidence 
in the flesh. Again, he's saying that true salvation is not based on anything that you can do by human attainment or human achievement. Folks, it doesn't happen. It doesn't help you if you think you've done enough to please God. Because listen, folks, Paul picks up that little phrase, in the flesh. And you'll notice in verse 4, he mentions it again two times. And what you have to ask, what is Paul talking about? Well, as you read these verses, you discover what Paul is really doing here. He's kind of taking on the role of a spiritual accountant. And he's going to pull out the ledger sheets. And he's going to go and illustrate that nobody can get to heaven on the basis of religion. Right. Folks, listen to me. Do you know the difference between religion and salvation? Folks, religion is man's effort to get to God. Salvation is God reaching down to man. Amen. He's reaching down to us. Religion is our way of trying to earn our way to heaven. Salvation is God offering us salvation through the person of his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, after his death on the cross of Calvary. Folks, listen. In the next few verses, Paul is going to show you that you cannot get to heaven on the basis of any human effort. No way that you're going to work your way to heaven. And it's very important today because the fact of the matter is there are thousands of people who really think that they're going to get into heaven because of something that they've done. Because the way they've lived their life. Because they, they feel like they're just a good person and they've done enough to please God. And they've made enough to make God happy and God's going to say, come on into my heaven, folks. Listen, that is a lie of Satan. So when you're going to talk about some religious matters, well, I'm going to be talking about those religious matters today, and I'm going to ask you honestly to take a look at these things that I present to you, and there are going to be some things that are going to appear as liabilities, and then you're going to see the profit and the loss column, and I hope that when you look at everything, you'll evaluate your life and see if you truly know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. First of all, let's pull, pull out now the credit column because you see Paul says, if there's anybody who thinks he can get to heaven on human achievement, then he says, I've got more on that side of the ledger than anybody else would ever have. And then he begins to give us that, those religious assets that he has. In fact, he names seven assets that he has that ought to be good enough, he, he would have believed, to take him right into heaven. Well, let's look at that. Number one, he begins by pointing out that he had proper ritual. Look what he says in verse 5. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day. Now, the significance of that in the Jewish religion is that if you had uh, been a proselyte to the Jewish religion, you would be circumcised at whatever age you may have uh, been when you became a proselyte. If you were an Ishmaelite, the Ishmaelites were circumcised on the 13th day, but Paul says, being born a Jew, I was circumcised on the eighth day because I had the proper ritual. A lot of people think if you've gone through some ritual, that will get you into heaven. Folks, listen, I never tire of watching people follow the Lord in the waters of believers' baptism. Man, I, I love that. I love watching someone be baptized. But folks, I hope you understand that water has absolutely nothing to do with your getting into heaven. Amen. That water has nothing to do with that. You can be baptized so many times that every bullfrog in the pond knows your name. But that's not going to get you to heaven, folks. It's not going to do it. So you, ha you can have the proper ritual. You can be baptized. But if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, that's not going to get you to heaven. You can join a church. I mean, you can join First Baptist Church, but it's no guarantee that that's going to get you to heaven. A church is not what it takes to get you to heaven. It's all Jesus. Amen. It's all about him. So Paul says, I hope you understand. I had the proper ritual, but that's not enough. Then he goes on. Secondly, he says, I had a proper relationship because I was of the stock of Israel. What he means is I can trace my ancestry back. All the way back to the father of the 12 tribes. All the way back to Jacob. And you see, your ancestry has nothing to do whatsoever with your personal responsibility to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. 
You say, well, Brother Jay, my grandpa was a Baptist preacher. Amen. I'm glad. But that's not going to get you to heaven. You may say, well, Brother Jay, my dad was a Baptist deacon. Well, that's good, but that doesn't get you into heaven. Well, Brother Jay, my mother was a Sunday school teacher. Well, praise the Lord, but that does no way guarantee that you're going to get to heaven, folks. Listen, salvation is not passed on like the color of your hair or the shape of your nose. Salvation is a personal matter, and it takes personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It has to be that personal faith. Proper relationship is a wonderful thing, but it doesn't give you salvation. Thirdly, he says he had the proper respectability. He says, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, there were 12 tribes of the children of Israel. The tribe of Benjamin was the first family of the nation, really. Benjamin was the first family when it came to anything in the nation. Jerusalem was in the borders of the tribe of Benjamin. It was the tribe of Benjamin that remained loyal to David when all the other of the whole nation deserted him. So Paul is saying, I was in the first family. I was among the elite. I was the elite. But there's certainly a place for respectability. There's something to be said for culture. I've always thought that culture with Christ is a beautiful thing. But folks, let me tell you something. Culture without the Lord Jesus Christ is ultimate crudity. You may wear your glasses on a stick. You know what I'm talking about? And you may eat out of silver bowls when you eat your supper tonight, not lunch, because you're going to be eating downstairs, right? You better. See, folks, it's not where you're from. It's not where you live. It's not where you stand in society. It's not where you stand in the society of, so, of the social society of Spring Hill that counts. What counts is, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? That's the only thing that matters, folks. That's the key. That's what really counts. Fourthly, he had the proper race. He said, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. That means he was a part of the family of people that when they had been moved to other places in the empire, they never lost their racial identity. That means he retained the Hebrew customs. He retained the Hebrew language. He had the proper race. He was proud of his race, folks. Listen, there's nothing wrong with being proud of your race. You ought to be proud of, of who you are. Don't think that that's going to get you one bit closer to heaven because what color your skin is or where you came from, folks. Salvation has nothing to do with your racial identity. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, but that didn't get him currency in the bank of heaven. And then he went on, he says, well, I had the proper religion concerning law, the law. I was a Pharisee. I mean, think about it, a Pharisee. The Pharisees were, really means they were the separated ones. They were the spiritual athletes of Judaism. I mean, their moral life was impeccable. The Pharisees, morally speaking and religiously speaking, were really right there on the very top. I mean, they were orthodox. They observed every detail of the law. They attended to every ritual. Every observance that was required, they were doing it. Paul says, and I, I was a Pharisee. Now that, that's just about as high as you could get in the religion of his day. But just think, because you're totally involved and totally active in your church, do you think that that's going to get you in heaven? Just because you're actively involved in the church? It's not, folks. That doesn't mean you're going to get into heaven. Now, I think if you're truly a born-again Christian, you're going to want to get actively involved in the church. You're going to want to do everything you can in the life of the church. But that doesn't guarantee you heaven. There's only one thing that guarantees you heaven, and I've said it before. Let me say it again. Let me know. Let you say it. What is it that gets you into heaven? Jesus. Jesus, that's right, folks. It's all about Jesus. Then he had, he had the proper involvement. He says, concerning zeal, he said, I was persecuting the church. I mean, the Jews looked upon zeal as the greatest quality of their religious life. I mean, to be totally passionate about what you believe. Paul was so zealous about what he believed that he was willing to kill anybody that disagreed with him. Think about that. He was willing to kill that's pretty zealous, wouldn't you say? 
A lot of pe people think that their religious zeal is what's going to count when they stand at the gates of heaven. But remember what Jesus said. Jesus says many in that day will, will, will say, we have preached in your name. We have cast out devils in your name. We have done many wonderful works in your name. And then I will profess unto you, depart from me, I never knew you. Folks, listen. That's not going to get you into heaven. And then the seventh thing, he had proper righteousness. He said, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. And that word blameless means that there was nothing on the outside that anybody could point to in his life as an object to blame him. In other words, when people looked at Paul when it came to religion, there was no point of criticism that they could make. Outwardly, he was blameless, but you see, inwardly, Paul knew that there was something that wasn't right. Inwardly, Paul knew there was something that was missing. On the inside, Paul knew that he really wasn't what he ought to be. Let me ask you a question today. How is it between you and God? How is it between you and God? If there's anybody in this building who thinks you can get to heaven on the basis of your religion... Here is a man who had climbed the very ladder of religion. And what he's saying is, you lay your credentials alongside of mine and you'll come up short. And if you're trying to get to heaven on the basis of your religion, you haven't even measured up to the level that I have. Why do you think that's going to happen? Right. Folks, it's not. So what he's done now, he's laid down the credit side of all these religious assets but then you have to pull out another sheet and let's look at the debit column. Because in verse 7 he says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Paul says there's something that happened to cause me no longer to, to look at everything I had placed in the religious part of my life. He said, I thought it was gain, but not anymore. I counted it as loss. It was useless. He said suddenly a change takes place. And what I had considered to be assets now becomes liabilities. You remember when Paul was on the road to Damascus with the letters of approval to allow him to persecute those who are followers of the Lord Jesus. He was smitten to the ground. He saw a light above the brightness of the sun. And Jesus revealed himself to the Apostle Paul. And Paul made the startling discovery that of all those things in the flesh that he had depended on, to try to earn his interest in the heaven, to try to merit his approval with God, after he saw Jesus, he realized that they had absolutely no value at all. They were worthless. I tell you, it'd be like a, it would be like a Confederate countryman buying a million dollars worth of credit, uh, Confederate money the day before Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox. Think about that. I mean, he's a millionaire on one day. The next, year, next day, he's got his hands full of worthless paper. And that's what it was. And you see, that's exactly what happens when a person comes face to face with their own sin and with what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross. In other words, suddenly there was a reversal of fortune. Suddenly there was a change in his method of accounting. What things were gained to me, these I've counted loss. <coughs> Excuse me. He said, I had to put them over in the debit column. Now that word lost there really means dung. And let me tell you, if you're trying to depend on anything that you've done, or anything that you've tried to merit that you have in your religious life, and you think that's going to get you to heaven, folks, the Bible says it's not a thing in the world but religious garbage. It's garbage. Now he had a choice to make. Over here were all of his religious assets and over here was all was Jesus. He had to decide which one of those he wanted to depend on to get him to heaven. Do I want to depend on all my religious assets? Or am I going to depend on Jesus? Well, folks, listen. That's the same decision that we have to make in our own life, isn't it? The same decision. You can put your church membership, you can put your baptism, you can put all your religious works and all your good deeds. You can put anything you want to that will stack up over here and you, make you think that you're a good person. 
<coughs> but over here you put the Lord Jesus Christ, you put the shedding of his blood on Calvary's cross. And folks, listen, which is the most valuable to you? You have to make the choice. You have to decide, I'm trusting Jesus. I trust him. I tell you folks, if you've got an IQ above plant life, surely you can make that choice. I believe that. You've got to turn from your sin, and you've got to totally turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we've got one more column, and I want to look at the prophet column. He says in verse 8, I have suffered the loss of all things that I may gain Christ. I've suffered everything, he said, but yet I have gained Christ. Look at the first part of the verb. I also count all things but loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. I've told y'all many times, I was a 13-year-old boy when I trusted the Lord Jesus as Lord in my life. He came into my life and really and truly I hardly knew him. I hardly knew him, but let me tell you, the surpassing worth which has been mine of getting to know Jesus over my lifetime. I've been a pastor for close to 40 years, maybe over 40 years now. And I've grown every single year. I mean, I learn more and more about Jesus every year. And I want to tell you something, knowing more of his love, knowing more of his care, knowing more of his grace, knowing more of his goodness to me, knowing more of what he has promised me in eternity. Whew, I want to tell you something, it is a surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Nothing that this world has even comes close to knowing Christ. Then he says in verse 9, And be found in him, not having the righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. All right. We've come now. It's time to draw the line. It's time to total up. It's time for you today to make your choice. If you'll choose Jesus this morning... You'll have everything to gain, nothing to lose. But folks, listen. If you choose anything or anyone but Jesus, you're going to have nothing to gain and everything to lose. So it's decision time. What's your decision? I hope and I trust that you can say to me this morning, Brother Jay, I have already, already know Jesus. There's no doubt in my mind. There's no doubt in my heart. I know Jesus. And if you do, I say praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. But if you're sitting here this morning and you've got doubt in your heart, you just don't know, <coughs> why don't you come and make sure? Come and make sure. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you know in your heart, I have never truly accepted Jesus into my life. Folks, listen. Don't walk out of here today until you look up to Jesus and say, Jesus, please forgive me. I'm a sinner. I need you in my life, Lord. Please come into my life. Save me. Give me your great love and your great salvation. I want you to stand with me as we sing.